Good afternoon. It's really my pleasure to be here today to talk about the issues that are so important to our time. I want to talk about the climate, the planet, sustainability, but I first want to put it in a little bit of context. Just think about what we've been living through. We've lived through the worst pandemic in 100 years. We're now living through the biggest war in Europe in 70 years. We're addressing the most severe macroeconomic headwinds, or recession, if you will, that the planet has seen in the past 12 years. And we're frankly dealing with the biggest change in the world's climate in 11,000 years, when the last ice age ended. And all of us in this room and around the world have been living through all of this together in just the last two years. If you wake up in the morning and you feel a little anxious, I think we're all justified. It's a time that frankly requires that we focus on lots of different things. That's part of what brought me here to Lisbon to the Web Summit today and this year. It was in part to stand up this morning with the Vice Prime Minister and Vice President and Digital Minister for Ukraine so that I could announce that Microsoft would extend throughout all of 2023 and commit, in effect, another $100 million of technology aid to support not just the government, but the people of Ukraine. <clears throat> But even while we defend Ukraine, while we recover from COVID, we can't lose focus on the world's climate. It's just so clear, I think, that the climate crisis will outlast every one of these other crises that is grabbing our attention. And that's what I want to talk about. We live in a world where, frankly, all of us, whether we're individuals, as consumers, or work for a business, need to put our own house in order. That's what we're doing at Microsoft, as we're striving to become carbon negative, water positive, and zero waste by 2030. It's transforming every part of our company. But what's really interesting to me is the way this is sweeping across the economy in every country around the world. Already, more than 3,900 companies have made climate pledges. That is good news, and that number is growing every single day. But we all face the same challenge. How do we turn these pledges into progress? Well, one of the things that is becoming so clear is we need to do many different things. We need to change the way we work. We need to look at all of our different business processes and operations. But I think one thing increasingly is now coming to the forefront. All of us are going to need to find new ways, frankly, to innovate our way out of this mess. I mean, in so many ways, we benefited humanity as a whole from almost three centuries of the Industrial Revolution that started in England. It's brought prosperity to so much of the world but it has created a level of carbon emissions, 51 billion tons this year, that is now unsustainable. Last week's reports from the United Nations underscored that even more. We basically can only emit about another 420 billion tons before we use up our entire budget, if you will, if we're in fact going to keep the world's increase in temperature below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And at current rates, we will do that in just 11 years. How the heck are we going to move fast enough? Well, one of the things we found at Microsoft as we've worked with so many of the companies where you all work is that there are a number of enabling factors on which we all rely. We need to put new data to work, harness the power of data and AI. We need to build new markets, especially new carbon markets. 
We need innovation for new laws and policies, especially carbon policy and electricity policy and waste policy. And we need to foster new skills. In fact, just yesterday, we released a new a report at Microsoft that we call Closing the Sustainability Skills Gap. Think of it this way. When humanity first decided to go to the moon back in the 1960s, it required that physics move from a narrow academic discipline to the mainstream. And even more so for most of our lives, the digital era required that computer science move into schools and that digital fluency becomes something that all of us acquire. Businesses invested in skilling their workforce. Now we are entering a new era. It's an era that will be marked by a sustainability revolution for the next three decades, and it will require that sustainability science and sustainability fluency move into schools, into colleges and universities, but even more so, especially with the tight deadline we have, that we move it into the workforce as quickly as we can. That's part of what we all need to work together to do. But perhaps even more than that, we need to move as fast as we can to connect new digital technology with new climate companies. Companies that, frankly, many of you work for, or companies that many of you may found in just the next few years. Because the truth of the matter is the key to the future is gonna be a new generation of people with a new generation of technology coming from a new generation of companies. And I think the best way to see what's emerging is frankly to focus on a few of these and the stories that they tell about where the world is going. One of my favorites is called Planet. It's based in San Francisco. It makes very small satellites. They call them doves. They weigh about four kilograms or about nine pounds. I happened to see their plant just a couple of weeks ago. These satellites go up, they have telescopes, they have, photo, they have photographic capability, but within a few years, they'll be able to measure all the methane on the planet, all the carbon dioxide emissions on the planet in real time. That data will be a game changer, both for enabling us to measure on a planetary basis what's going on, but also help governments focus on individual sites and address through regulation the need to reduce emissions. Planet is one of the companies that is taking our climate revolution into the future. But what's interesting is it's not just startups in the corporate space. There are startups in the nonprofit space as well. Seeds is a nonprofit in India. I visited them six weeks ago. They're using data that comes from satellites and they're using AI that comes from Microsoft. But what they're doing with it is taking photographic images of all of the rooftops in India and using an algorithm to identify homes that, for example, will be most susceptible to excessive heat. And they identify ways to help the people who live in those homes through very simple technology, namely burlap bags that are used to ship vegetables, shield the rooftops to lower the temperature inside. It's an extraordinary combination of high-tech and low-tech coming together, and then volunteers, many in high school, take the data and they go visit homeowners and they give people advice about how to keep their family safe. It's part of what the world needs to do to adapt to climate change, something we'll hear a lot more about just next week when COP27 convenes in Egypt. But it's not just adaptation that is important. When we focus on the need for carbon emissions reductions, for mitigation of climate problems, so much of what we're really needing to focus on is the world's energy transition because so much of the carbon that is emitted today, in fact, comes from the generation of energy. And here, too, the innovation in startups is extraordinary.
Just two weeks ago, there was an announcement of new investments in a company called Lanzajet. Microsoft committed $50 million to Lanzajet earlier this year through our billion dollar carbon innovation fund and then Breakthrough Energy Catalyst, something that we've committed $100 million to with many others, including the European Commission supporting Bill Gates, provided a comparable investment. Lanzajet is doing something great that I'll bet will benefit almost all of us in this room if you came here on an airplane. Because they're taking feedstock and even waste, and they're using it to create sustainable aviation fuel. Fuel that can power jets while reducing carbon emissions. A great example of the kinds of technology innovations that can ensure that prosperity and travel and people getting together can continue even while we reduce carbon emissions. An even more interesting example to me in some ways is a nonprofit called Terra Praxis. This started as an incubation project by a group of employees in Microsoft who came together in a hackathon, but it has been taken by this extraordinary nonprofit. It looks at the world and sees the generation of coal. There are more than 5,000 coal-powered electricity plants in the world. They generate 37% of the world's electricity. And let's remember, we still live in a time when electricity, I think probably the greatest invention of the 19th century, has still not reached 770 million people on our planet. But the problem with coal, as we all know, is it emits a lot of carbon. In fact, last year, 29% of the world's carbon emissions came from those 5,000 coal plants. So what should we do? Well, a lot of people look at coal plants and they say, we need to close them down. Well, the problem is we need electricity. And the interesting thing about coal plants is there's actually more to them than the furnace that is burning coal. Think of it, they're connected to the electrical grid. They have water cooling capacity. Typically, a coal plant has 12,000 employees that actually are very skilled in running power generation. So what Terra Praxis saw that others did not was that coal plants could be converted. They could be repurposed. They could be repowered, in many cases, to run small modular reactors or fourth generation nuclear reactors, the kind of nuclear reactors that for decades have been in submarines and on aircraft carriers. And if you did that, you could cut the cost of building a new power plant by up to 30%. And what Terra Praxis saw was a need that they could help fill in two ways. First of all, if you run a coal plant, you probably don't know how to convert it to a nuclear power plant. So they're taking all of the knowledge and expertise, they're standardizing it, and they're making it available for free to coal plants around the world to accelerate their innovation. And then they're working with Microsoft and MIT and others so we can standardize and accelerate the permitting process so that this repurposing of coal plants can move ahead faster. I think it's a great example of innovation at work. And then there's one last example that is another one of my favorites. It's a startup based in Switzerland called Climeworks. I had the opportunity to spend a Saturday morning with them a few weeks ago outside of Zurich. Look at that device that you see behind that logo. Each of those horizontal layers is about 15 meters long. And those are giant fans that engage in direct air capture. The air moves through, and there's, in effect, a big sponge that collects carbon. And after a couple of hours, the fan stops, it closes, it's a vacuum, and heat collects the carbon and releases it as gas. The gas is then taken, and it's cooled, it's turned into a liquid, and that in places around the world where the geology is right, including Iceland and parts of North America and elsewhere, 
It goes underground where it's collected in mineral form. And in effect, carbon is taken out of the air and it's deposited deep underground where it will remain for literally thousands of years. Climeworks stands for two things in my view. The first is this. It's extraordinary to see the technology and business model and economic innovation that can and needs to come together. Right now, we at Microsoft have invested in Climeworks through our Climate Innovation Fund to spur its technological progress, and we're purchasing carbon removal from it. We've made two and a half million tons of carbon removal purchases in the last two years, more than any other company. But what we see is that what costs $1,300 a ton today needs to come down to probably 100 or 150 in the next 20 years for this to take off. But take off it can. And that's the second thing that I think is so interesting. Think about the world that we need to create. Think about the world that so many of you are working to create. It needs to be a net zero world by the year 2050. What does that mean? It means that the 51 billion tons of carbon emissions this year need to be brought down to 12 or 10 or 8 or even lower, but we're still going to have some carbon emissions. So what we need to do to get to net zero is offset them through high-quality, long-duration carbon removal through new technology, like direct air capture. There will come a day in the future when the governments of the world will come together and you will read about a new climate convention. A climate convention that I will believe will require that the rich countries spend money to remove carbon from the atmosphere in a way that will benefit the planet as a whole. And a company like Climeworks and others will be a big part of it. We'll be needing to remove, say, 5 billion tons a year by 2050. But then think about what we can do for the rest of this century. We can continue to take that technology forward. We can continue to decide as a planet, as governments come together, whether we in fact want to go farther and reverse the impact of three centuries and correct this increase in temperature and start to bring it back down. You look at all of this and two things are clear in my opinion. First, this will be hard. This will be the hardest thing that humanity has ever done. We who are living today, those of you in this room, we need to look to the future and recognize that we need to do more in less time than almost any generation has ever done before. But when I look out and I see you, when I see the companies that you're building, when I see the technologies that you and others are inventing, I say this, four words that we should remember every day when we get up. This can be done. It's up to us, it's up to you to make it happen. Thank you very much.